in the Middle East, I'm kind of used to getting my ID checked. Now, in Jerusalem, when you go in, ladies, when you go into the mall, they check your purse going in, not coming out. They have no interest in what you stole. They're worried about what you left behind. So it's an entirely different mentality, and I've been there so much of my life that I really stopped thinking about ID checks. But tonight, I want to talk about building an infectious faith, and I want to talk about ID checks, identification checks. I heard that Israel is opening the 23rd of of May for the first flights that are coming in from overseas after a long season of closed airport. And they're not only taking your vaccine passport, but also doing a a, a PCR check because apparently there's a market in faking that you got a shot. So no matter what we do, there's always somebody who's figuring an angle around it. Now, with that in mind, I want you to remember that no matter what identity uh, system you put in place, somebody's going to circumvent it. That's where we're going. But stick a pin in that for a minute. Think with me through this book. We, in the beginning today, we're talking about how my walk and my talk have to align so there's no dissonance between what I'm saying I believe and what I'm living I believe. And that's from chapter one to the middle of chapter two. The second half of chapter two of this book deals specifically with people who start off with Jesus and then jump ship on the faith. They defect. How do you deal with the pain of that? And I hope in those few moments we were able to tackle a little bit of that. And chapter three really deals with how do you unmask lawlessness? What is lawlessness? And what's the greatest single difference between a saved and an unsaved person besides their eternal destination? And it's this. One follows Jesus. The other one makes up their own rules on morality, destiny, origin, and purpose. A worldview is made of four things. Origin, purpose, destiny, morality. When I was a kid, they were screwing around in the the, uh, uh, schools with origin. But the reason was to change morality. Because when you change the how we got here, why we're here, and where we're going, you change how you know what's right and what's wrong. So origin, purpose, destiny, and morality. I saw somebody writing it down, so I'll come back. Uh, My students do this all the time. They look at me with that panicked look of, I only have three. What are we going to do? Okay. (laughs) Look, truth has been a casualty for, for many people in the world these days. Deception has become such a normal tool that we're just used to being lied to. We really are. I mean, companies make promises about their product, and they know, guys, they know the product won't do that, and we just sort of accept that because we figure they'll update the software, and then it'll do what they told us it would do back when we spent 1200 bucks for it. Ordinary people present extraordinary happiness on Instagram. And then if you know them, you know that's not how their life is. In fact, there was a fascinating article. I clipped it out. I just thought I'd share it with you. This came from the Atlantic Magazine. It's called How to Invent a Person Online. This is a true article. On April 8th, 2013, the writer says, I received an envelope in the mail from a non-existent return address in Toledo, Ohio. Inside was a blank thank you note and an Ohio State driver's license. The ID belonged to a 28-year-old man named Aaron Brown, six feet tall, 160 pounds, with a round face, scruffy brown hair, thin beard, green eyes. His most defining feature, however, is that he didn't exist. I know because I created him. The author then goes on to describe how he could create an entire life of someone who can travel, they can shop, they can even protest, they can vote, but they don't exist. And he showed you that he did it. So that kind of messes with our head for all these security systems we have. Now, look, it's not a secret that people can fake identities. The Israelis are really good at checking you out. 
I mean, they do that stare down thing and they ask you questions and they'll ask you again. Somebody else will come up and ask you again. And honestly, what I tell people when they go into security is please don't start with, it all began in a cabin in 1956. It was a snowy night. Because the more you say, the more they're stacking up facts and double checking them. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, sir. No, sir. They have no interest in whether you ever get on the flight. They have a personal interest because they're personally liable if something happens on the flight. So they're protecting themselves. That's what they're doing. You know, if you go to Google, where everything can be known, when you go to Google and you put in fake identification, I tried this just to get ready for this, and and uh, first thing you'll find is the Florida State Constitution, Section 322.212, stating that it's unlawful for you to have fake ID, and right below it, there'll be an ad for great fake ID. <laughs> scannable fake ID cards. Buy scannable fake ID cards with UV holograms at great fake ID. Best ideas with all the security features replicated and made from the best updated ID templates. Now, I got to tell you, I was, a little, I was a little troubled that criminals aren't even working that hard these days. They're like advertising on Google. So I was thinking things are getting kind of hard up. And here's what I, look, forgery isn't new. Faking IDs isn't new. When you go to the last, uh, to the fourth chapter, I'm sorry, of First John, you'll find out that he picks up the idea that there are fakes and you need to check this out. One of the problems we're facing, guys, is that we're trying to represent Jesus in a community where some of us are trying to actually make trouble, where they don't really have Jesus and that's not really true about them. Because anybody can claim they believe. So here's the truth. Look at the problem in verse 1. It says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Would it surprise you to know that not everybody who opens a Bible is actually preaching what it says? I try to teach my Bible students that there's a difference from speaking from the Bible and speaking the Bible. You, you, can, you can open it up. All kinds of people are, are reading an article of something that was powerful in their life and then looking for Bible verses so that they can populate the article to say what they wanted to say anyway. That's not the same thing as teaching the Word. When you teach the Word, you go from the Word, and that's where you get the ideas, principles, and morals for life. So... John's going to take some time, and in chapters 4 and 5, he's going to give us marks that you can check for certainty of your own identification. Now, these can work two ways. For one thing, I want you to put enough of an antenna up to be concerned about what you hear on the airwaves and be concerned about people who say they represent Jesus and compare them to what he says. But this isn't to turn you into some kind of sleuth or suspicious person. One of the things we have to do with passages like this is ask the question, am I what I'm supposed to be? So all the way through this, this was personal to me. If I'm up here talking, you remember James says, stop being so many teachers, theirs is the greater condemnation. In other words, know God's word or please shut up because you're just making it worse. Well, as a guy who goes out and gives the word of God, I certainly want to know do I stand up to these tests? The very first one is in verses two through six. And this is a mark that's on the life of a believer that if it's on your life, you can certainly see the spirit of God at work. And that mark is a certainty about God's truth. That is when God speaks to you from his word, it goes lodging in your heart and you're not waffling all over the place. There is a certainty about that truth. Look at verse 2. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, of which you have heard that is coming, and now it is already in the world. Here's what I want you to know. Teachers need to demonstrate that they know Jesus as he was presented by the apostles. Because there's an awful lot of people preaching the Bible they wish God wrote. 
They're out there making up the narrative and talking about Jesus. Listen, I have been everywhere Jesus was. I have followed his life and taught it for almost 40 years. I've worn out sandals. I've walked the mountains. And here's what I know. What a lot of people are saying about Jesus is some kind of hallmark special version that doesn't have anything to do with the original Jesus walking on the hillside. Jesus was a lot tougher than some people think. He wasn't just walking around like Mr. Rogers saying, won't you be my neighbor? He was actually on top of things going, look, if you're not going to deny yourself and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Now, I'm not saying he was unloving. He's Jesus. I'm saying the truth sometimes hurts. Ouch. So teachers needed to stand up to what was originally taught. Look, it's clear enough. God's spirit is at work in those that acknowledge that Jesus is the Messiah. But but look at verse four for a second, because they also have to, believers are, are supposed to remember the power of God in the gospel. That's what lifts us so that we're not discouraged. He says, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them. Now, wait a minute. In the first century, There's the smallest number of believers to the largest number of unbelievers in a ratio that had ever existed in the church. He's not coming at this with 2,000 years of hymn books and seminaries and publishing houses and radio stations and and, and album covers. He's, He's out there before the gymnatorium, before the PowerPoint. He's at the beginning. And he says, little children, you've overcome them. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, can I just ask you something? Do you think it looked like that? A bunch of believers huddled in a little villa at 4 a.m. because the slaves that knew Jesus only had off when the master was asleep. By the way, it was illegal to meet at night in Rome. And the original believers that were arrested were not arrested for believing in Jesus. They were arrested for for meeting at night and breaking the orders of Rome, allowing people of an equestrian class to sit next to a brothel slave and all have a love feast together. That just isn't Roman. See, we've been countercultural from the beginning. Look, when Paul was sitting, waiting to be executed, Nero was emperor. He looked powerful. Paul looked like nothing. Today, people name their dog Nero, but their children Paul. So you can't tell on the day it happens what it's going to happen. So we have to trust the power of God. We have to trust the overcoming power of God, even when you can't see it, even when you don't know, even when you're not a majority of anything. How discouraging is it to to see that many false varieties of our message float around? There's the Jesus plus conspiracies that are all over the place. You know, you just need Jesus plus whatever we're selling, and then you'll have salvation. Some of the variations are because Bible teaching has been sloppy, and we admit that. But I think if you go across the church today, I'm in like eight denominations speaking. Can I tell you? People are getting better and sharper, not weaker and more tolerant of untrue statements. You know why? Guys, look, I'd be lying to you if I told you that the easier times are ahead. You're going to get less fussy and you're going to get more loving when more of the world doesn't want to hear from us. Don't get scared. We got Jesus. Overcomer, it's right there. But at the same time, just know, when we realize that there's not a lot of popularity to who we are, we're going to hang and cling closer to one another. You know why? Because I spent most of my life in a place where eight people is a mega church. Okay? And let me tell you something. You don't care if he's an infralapsarianist or a superlapsarianist. And if you don't know what that is, you're a happy person. Don't even look it up. (laughs) There's a... There's a profound trust in the word of God that has to be there. Look at verse five. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak as from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. He says, 
Look at the emphatic way he says it. He says, you can know the truth and know what's not true. Look, I said to an earlier group, faith is God glasses, okay? Faith in the Bible has this long, the essence of things not seen. But, but here's what he's saying. Faith is when I put on my glasses, I see things differently. And when you put on God's word and God's truth, you see the world through it. A biblical world view is what pistis means, faith. So everywhere you go in the Bible, look for, with faith, you can move mountains. It doesn't mean you can pierce them and make them move. It means you can see that God is at work. And without them, you'd never see what he's doing. So here's what I want you to see. He says there has to be the ability to pick out truth from God's word and be confident that you have the truth and walking in the truth while everybody else is making it up. Honestly, they're making up their morality and they're not going to come out of this without crashing into the guardrail. This is the thing. People are walking around like they can rewrite the moral rules and there's no cost for this. And their kids are angry in the streets. And they don't know why. They want the benefits of a biblical morality, but they don't want to walk according to the Bible. Well, here's the thing. Lots of people want the benefits of a marriage without walking in the rules of a marriage. How's that working out? So here's the truth. The first mark is very evident. But the second mark, like unto, it starts in verse 7. And this is, when you check somebody's ID in the faith, beyond the truths, I want you to look at their relationships. See, it's not only truth. Being a Christian is not just ascribing to truth. It's also committing to relationships. Look at it in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, you're going to object. You're going to go, wait a minute. Lost people can love, but ultimately, they've never experienced proper, true, real love. They're eating imitation chocolate, not the real stuff. You can tell I'm on this diet. I've been on chocolate for days. It's because I'm losing weight and I could eat my arm right now. That's just the way it is. But here's the truth. When when you love one another, you, you celebrate one another. And it makes everything sweeter. There's an old saying that says a shared sorrow is half a sorrow. A shared joy is double joy. There's something about, there's something sweet about doing life together. And God said, the God of heaven said, the church is not an individual sport. It's a team play. And so we've been weakened by a year of being away from each other. And now it's time to knit it back together. It's interesting to me because I don't want you to get cynical about this, but there was somebody who wrote this about the Savior. They said, There once was a carpenter who didn't overcharge for his work. There was a physician who who healed the sick for free. There was a man who fed people at no charge. How did they pay him? They crucified him. I want you to see that God expressed love by doing what? God so loved the world that he what? See, talk is cheap. Sacrificial giving is tough. And if I'm going to love you, it means I'm going to do the best for you at the highest cost to me. That's what we're called to do. And it says in verse 9, by this, the love of God is manifested, made clear in us. People are supposed to look at the church and go, well, that's clearly a demonstration of the love of God. Has that been your experience in church? Because it hasn't been mine. Honestly, they could say, look how cantankerous people are. There are some people that have the gift of discouragement and they just love to share their gift. Something happened to the church. Something happened when they tuned into their stations at home and then compared their pastor to their pundit. 
That's not a way to run your life. That guy has no investment in you at all. My, my generation had the televangelist, you know, the guy with 13 suits and 13 sermons, white shoes, big hair, you know, the type. And he'd get on there and say, I just love you in Jesus name. Well, and then would you send me that check right where you are? And here's the thing. Yeah, he loves you. You're sending him checks. You send me checks. I'll love you too. (laughs) The point is he's not going to be there for you. He is. And the truth is, the staff here is going to work their tail off to love you, to grow you, to help enable you to become what God wants you to be. The rest of it's just a TV show. They're not going to be there. People are so shocked when they find out celebrities aren't who they are on TV. Are you who you are when the video camera goes on? He says, by this, the love of God is made clear that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is, in, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, sent his son to be the propitiation or satisfaction for our sins. Here's the point. God is initiating in his love. We are responsive in our love. We love because he loved We didn't know how to love properly before we experienced his love. It doesn't mean we didn't try. It doesn't mean we weren't nice people. Look, guys, you can be a really nice person. You can be a good person. You can help little old ladies across the street, and you can go, you know, shovel their sidewalk, and you can do all the nice things you can do. You can be good. You just can't be righteous without Jesus. Righteous is a judicial standard unattainable by lost man. And and God can't accept you as good. He's got to accept you as righteous. And without Jesus, you, you can't get in. But the good news is with Jesus, you not only can get in, you will get. When you cry out to God, here's what's happening. The enemy is doing this. Don't listen to her. She has done so many things. And then the son gets up and says, Father, that's one one of mine right there. Would you listen to her? This, This daughter of God right here, this is one of yours. I bring her to you. And as our advocate, he stands in the gap and makes it up for us. You know, when you read carefully verses 9 and 10, you discover how the love of God was made clear. God sent his son. This is not sentimental feeling. When we say, beloved, love one another, we're not saying get all gooey about each other. Love is acting deliberately to meet a need because there's a need expecting nothing in return. That's what it is. And you are called to love one another. Our, our love is supposed to be plain to see. <laughs> There's a story about an uh, American engineer, and uh, he was dating a girl in Tennessee, and the company sent him to Ireland, and he was going to be in Ireland for two years. Now, this is back some years ago. They weren't going to ship him back and forth, so the couple didn't have a lot of money, so she remained back in Tennessee, and he went over to Ireland, long-distance relationships, you know, and she was worried, so they were writing back and forth, and she was worried that he was going to get with one of those lassies over there, the red hairs and all that, and and so she was writing and saying, no, I don't want you to be looking at those girls, and he wrote back and said, look, I'm not going to tell you that I haven't been tempted. I'm not going to tell you that they're not really fascinating and beautiful. I'm going to tell you that I'm waiting for our marriage. I'm in this for our marriage. The next thing he gets is a box with a harmonica in it that says, I've given you this harmonica so that every time you feel any sense of temptation, you'll you'll learn the harmonica. Well, two years passes. You can figure the story out. He gets off the plane. He comes up to her. And before he can hug her, he says, "Eh, well, 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 before there's hugging and kissing, play the harmonica for me. Okay, she's testing him out to see if he's actually been doing this. Look, the bottom line is that you're supposed to know, it's supposed to be obvious whether or not you're doing the thing. That's supposed to be the point. Verse 11 says, Beloved, if God so loved that you're still scratching your head about the harmonica. Okay, hang on. (laughs) Hang in there with me. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 
You know, I keep saying it. John says it even more than I did. I need you to hear something. One of the devil's strongest tools is isolation. What he does is convince you that you're not like other people or no one else would understand. And he boxes you in so that you go searching Google looking for, for all those other disaffected people that are misunderstood. Listen, if you want people who wear pink and eat burgers on Tuesday, there's a Google group for that. Because you almost can't find a group of people that do weird stuff that isn't out there somewhere. And what's happened in this generation is they've created these groups and made normal behaviors out of abnormal behaviors. And here's the thing. People with no standards always look more tolerant. They, they all love me there. Well, of course they love you there. They don't have a right and wrong. If they actually had a right and wrong, they might actually say, you know, it's not happening too well for you. So we come off as judgy. They come off as tolerant. And what they are is walking along with no standard of any kind. The problem is when you don't have laws, people crash into each other. When you don't have laws, there's no... Can you imagine playing a basketball game with no rules? Somebody's going to get hurt. Can you imagine playing marriage with no rules? Somebody's going to get hurt. Playing family with no rules? Playing society with no rules? Well, hang on, because you're about to see the bruises. Look, as we withdraw a biblical foundation in our country, we compensate by bucket loads of tax money spent on social services for the unintended consequences of removing the moral structure. That's what we're doing now. So let me just say this. If God's love required giving that was precious, his only son, what should ours be? Bottom line is I want you to be a lover and not a talker. That's what I want you to be. Stop talking, church. Love. Because people are going to walk in, and more than ever, the more it breaks down out there and gets cold, the more they're going to need the warmth of the fire in here, where people actually do love each other. It doesn't mean that they ignore each other's sin. It doesn't mean they act like everything's okay when it's not. It means they love you enough to go, honey, I'm thinking maybe you're kind of crashing into some rails here. Can we talk? Well, I don't want people to think I'm being, I'm going to be judgmental. You don't have to be judgmental. Judgmental is an attitude. That's an attitude. I, I, I can tell you right now, when you know somebody's pulling for you, you will listen to what they're saying. Because people want to know you love them before they care what you know about life. So here's the truth. There's a third mark. I want you to check this one. Now, now you got to read a little bit to get into this from verse 12. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. So what he's saying is, if you want to be a billboard for who God is, then love one another. And there's something that happens in the dynamic of people together that shows Jesus more clearly. His spirit pulls us together and stuff happens between us. Godly stuff, holy things, righteous things that the world goes, nobody acts like that. Well, yeah, we do because we're family. This is a family thing we're doing here. And then he goes on and he, he, he tells us that I want you to think of, I want you to think of the believers in this room like Christmas lights. You, you had Christmas lights. Now, back in, the, some of you don't know what I'm talking about, but in the old school Christmas lights, if one bulb went out, the rest of the string went out. Some of you still buying the cheap lights. Okay, all right, we're on the same page. All right, here's the thing. The problem is the electricity comes out of the cord, it goes through, it lights up these bulbs, but it also goes through the filament. And if the filament breaks, the rest of the bulbs don't get anything. So what I'm saying is he has wired us to receive his love, but also pass it through to the next guy. And if, we, if it breaks with us, the next guy's sitting there without any light going, hey, I'm trying to do Christmas. What's happening? <laughs> Drop your eyes down to verse 20 for a second. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. John, that is so judgy. 
For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God who is not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should also love his brother. So the simple, profound truth is that if we're going to have a commitment to a God we can't see, we got to have a commitment to a brother or sister we can see. Now, here's the mark, verse 14. When you check for ID, there's commitment to truth, there's demonstration in the love of people and relationship, and the third one is the testifying of the Savior. In other words, words count. Okay? So he says, I want you to, I want to hear the songs of the heart of this person. Look at verse 14. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And the person who walks around with an anthem on their mouth that they testify that God's word is true concerning Jesus and salvation. In fact, in verse 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him. He's, he's transfixed with Jesus, his person, his work. Well, that should tell you that one of the ID marks is when we testify of Jesus. I don't want you to come in here and say, Man, Square, this is a great place to learn the psychology for life. You can get that from John Tesh on the radio. And here's the fact of the matter. You can get it from a therapist. This is the exaltation of Jesus Christ. And when you come into this place, we're going to talk Jesus. We're going to exalt Jesus. And when we do, we're going to testify that Jesus has changed our life. Jesus got me a great wife. Jesus gave me a great life. Jesus gave me what I have. We read it in the liturgy today. Let me give you another mark. It's verse 16. And this is undying hope. It's one of the marks of a believer, undying hope. So he says, we have come to know and believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this love, by this love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. Now listen, there's no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Listen, Christianity teaches that there is both coming judgment and a positive reason to look hopeful when Jesus returns. You know why? Because the person who's coming loves me. And because of that love, I know that everything he's doing in my life is to bring about the plan that is going to ultimately touch me. The rest of chapter four and chapter five go on like this, but I wanna just close with something. This is the words of Paul. It's about God's love. And I want you to think about it. But in all things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Beloved, there was a time at the end of Paul's ministry, the man traveled 10,000 land miles, not including the boats. Here's what I know about Paul. If he gets on a boat, get off, because it's going down, okay? That's what I know about him. 10,000 land miles bringing the gospel to people. It's all over now. He's written 2 Timothy. Last of his words are done. He's tried to do what he could to run his lap, but he now knows that the baton is being snapped in the hands of Timothy and Titus and Barnabas and Silas. I don't know if you knew this, but Romans really had a very tiny prison, half the size of this room for, for a million people in Rome. You know why? They sent you home. Where are you gonna run? Everywhere's Rome. You wanna go live with barbarians? They'll eat you. So you're gonna stay here and please show up on time for your beheading, 9 a.m. sharp. Please look good and clean up first so you die like a Roman. 
Now, can I tell you, I can't think like that. I really can't. I was talking to one of the, one of the women whose husband was beheaded in one of the orange jumpsuits. You know what I'm talking about? In Libya. I was talking to this woman. And she said the night before he died, he said, pray for me that I die well. Can I tell you as an American, I've never actually had that thought? Die well? Uh, I don't even want to be there when it happens. So here's the point. Paul walks up when it's his turn, and he lays his head down on this broken stump of a column, and a guy drops a sword and takes off his head. But he walked up to it confident. Why? What can give you a confidence? He wrote it in 2 Timothy. He said, Tim, Jesus rendered death inoperative. Katergeo, it's the word for he made it nothing. So he walked up there and said, it ain't nothing. And he walked up and he bowed over it and he let them take his head and then he fell into the arms of his Savior. See, it's that kind of positivity. It's that kind of understanding. It's that kind of certainty and hope and optimism to know that God loves me no matter what. It's that the world doesn't have. They're going to try five new other programs morally. They're going to crash into walls. And they're going to look at you with confidence in your eyes and a hope about your future and a love between you and go, what's going on over at that square building? What are those people all about? And that is exactly as it should be. Oh God, we turn to you tonight. There's so much more we could say. John wrote some really great stuff and your spirit pushed him along with his quill to give us truths that transform us. But tonight, right here in this moment, it occurs to me that we've been pushing around this word love and we've been pushing around this word uh, community and we've we've been trying to say that one of the watermarks of a believer is how we handle one another. We just came out of a year of being told to stay away from each other. We just came out of a year in which everybody kind of ran, ran back to their own hole and they held up and, and waited to see what's the future of our country. What's the future of our community? God, as we crawl out this time, would you remind us of what a privilege it is to have each other? Would you remind us of how great it is to be able to just come into this place? Maybe maybe we're not all ready to hug yet. Maybe we have to fist bump or elbow bump. Doesn't matter. It's a whole lot better than staying home in the living room. But help us to fire it up again and bring back the incredible sense of the Spirit's work between us, empowering us to go forward and make an impact right here in Smyrna. How we thank you for loving us. How we know that we're not particularly lovely. And yet, you didn't wait till we got our act together to love us. You loved us first, and now we can love. Oh God, you're so good. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Randy. Yeah, what a gift. Yeah, uh, it's my heart so stirred by you, Randy. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that, you know, every time I take, you know, you, you hear Dr. Smith speak, and then there's these moments where he gives you insight into so much of uh, his life he doesn't preach about. But I remember one of the times we were in... Uh, Palestine together and and you know we were talking about just the dynamics of just the tension of what's happening inside of the reality of America in our in our world and our lives and something you said tonight made remind me of something you said there of 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 when you realize that the only church you have in Israel is Jews and Arabs westerners people of very high and low status learning that they've all they've got, that you have to choose to unify around love, even in the midst of everything that is different. It taught you something about what church really was. And I just believe 
this is what we, what the Spirit of God is doing in this season, is that there is a, a radical awakening of a unity around love, not because we're all the same, whether we even find a way that it all feels the same, but that we have identified one another as those we would lay down our lives for. And that because of that, because the love of God is in us and through us, we have testified about who he is. We will demonstrate that testimony in our world through the way we love each other. There is going to be something that tips because friends, it is only love and action that can create what we long for. And that love and action can only come out of love for him. And this is why this love is starting to come and penetrate in a way it hasn't before. Because I just almost feel like there's been a season where we've tested other kinds of love and we've just realized there's no hope in them. And so we just gotta come back to the only anchor that can hold us. Love that acted towards us. Now love infested within us that now we get to act towards others in. And I'm just telling you, it's this kind of demonstration of love that will change and transform the world. It's, it's time for a re-anchoring into the fullness of a biblical picture of love. It will rescue us and it'll be the invitation of how the world is rescued from us. And so, uh, Randy, just thank you for pouring into our church all day. Friends, will you stand? Let me just bless you and send you. Listen, um, may you know the depths of God's love for you today. May you realize that he loved you so much he gave. And may you receive that love and live a life of response. And may we catch a vision of love that gives the tangible presence of love in our midst. Friends, have an incredible day. We love you. God bless you. And we'll see you soon.